very, very much. Thank you for showing support. Team Total Physio, very good. Um, so uh, my name is Dr. Sarah Collar, I'm an orthopedic surgeon based in Cairns, and this is a series of talks we're giving um, with our local um, allied health uh, teams. Um, so basically we've had a process of um, hearing some talks about whatever we want to talk about, and then there's an opportunity to ask questions, and then I've got some questions pre-prepared, and then we'll turn the cameras off, and then we ask the questions we really want to ask. So please, go ahead. Yeah, definitely ask some questions, guys. If anyone kind of want to interject, please um, keep it fairly open and nice and relaxed. Um, yeah, so I obviously a physio can start a physio. Um, tonight we're talking about the anterior cruciate ligament, as Dr. Cole um, explained. So my background, I've been in, in muscle physio for over a decade now. Um, initially right out of uni, got lucky and, and jumped into an elite sports clinic. Mm -hmm. um, so treating athletes right up to Olympic level across a variety of sports. Mm -hmm. and obviously, I was obviously a big chunk of that. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a bit of background. Um, personally, my interest spans across ACL's team um, within the running injuries. Um, outside of work, I've got three kids under three. That pretty much consumes a, a chunk of my uh, mm -hmm. my time. Mm -hmm. um, through the years, I've been quite competitive in a number of sports myself mm. as well. So, that does. Uh, surf lifesaving is probably a big one. Yeah, okay. biking, road cycling, yeah. uh, cross country running. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of stuff. Road and surf boat a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. right up to a national level. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, which is good. I think it, it as a physio, it kind of helps us understand yeah, athletes and mm -hmm. understand their perspective a little bit better. Yeah, yeah definitely mm -hmm. for, for what they might be going through, not just mm -hmm. physically. Um, given it's are you okay though? Throw that in. Yes, good. Um, so tonight we'll get through some ACL fast facts. Um, always a little bit challenging where to pitch the, the chat to. I'm not 100% sure of audience, so might start off a little bit easy. Um, some fast facts and fundamentals of, of the ligament locations, forces resisted, um, the, comp the composition of the ligament vascularity. Um, how, as a physio, we can diagnose an ACL rupture. Um, Dr. Cole I'm sure wants to throw a couple of uh, yeah. words in there as well. Um, the prevalence of tearing locations, um, which becomes important for outcomes as well. And then an evidence update um, from one of the local, well, not local, one of the sports physicians down in Sydney mm. um, on healing in the ACL. And then we'll have some questions, hopefully, from the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone's nodding. Question from everyone, yeah. Um, and maybe a couple online as well from those yeah. that are on the live feed. Mm -hmm. um, so ACL fast facts, guys, it's Australia has the highest incidence in the world um, for the ACL. Reconstructions, this is a couple of years old, this evidence now at 9,600 uh, reconstructions in 2000, 2001, jumping to nearly 17,000, um, know, 15 years later. So, you know, understanding that we're halfway to that again, we might assume that the reconstruction figure will be close to 20,000 in a year in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, massive jump from one year to the next. Expenses, again, I would estimate are closer to 200 million um, mm -hmm. per year in Australia. So, obviously, a huge amount of funding, a huge amount of evidence base goes into the anterior cruciate ligament, the reconstructions mm -hmm. of it, best methods, any advancements that can be mm -hmm. made. Uh, we know for prevalence that it's males 20 to 24 years old, females 15 to 19 years old. Uh, we also know that females have a MF of three to eight times the risk of ACL rupture, so quite high. Um, I'm completely open for ideas as to why Australia might have the highest incidence of ACL in the world. Um, I'd attribute it to AFL. Um, and as a bear here, I've got a network. Yeah, mm -hmm. AFL netball, um, a massive one. So mm -hmm. ultimately, it comes down to pretty shift sports, which is everything that kind of embodies Australian sport, whether it's yeah, AFL netball, touch footy, and mm -hmm. then all the contact stuff as well, like the league rugby union. Mm -hmm. um, we know on a on a whole, Australia is a very sporting nation. So mm -hmm. uh, whether that just contributes as as well that per capita we're more involved in sports. Mm -hmm. um, not entirely sure on that, but yeah, it's a, it's a big issue for us in Australia, the, the tearing of the ACL. So I guess what is the ACL? Um, in Latin, the anterior crux or anterior cross ligament. So it originates the posterior medial wall of the lateral femoral condyle and then inserting into the intercondylar notch on the tibia. 
stabilizers against the, the anterior translational tibia, and then obviously tibial internal rotation as well. Um, so two different fiber bundles as the anterior medial and posterior lateral. Um, depending on the location of the ligament, it's a it's a mix of collagen and uh, fibrocartilage. Um, obviously, as you get closer towards the, the ends, um, and this is becoming more bone. Um, it's important to remember that it's not homogenous, so it does have a blood supply. So a geniculate artery um, does supply the, the the more kind of uh, distal, uh, sorry, the most yeah the, the proximal end supplies the uh, medial uh, geniculate artery, and then the inferior is we get more uh, the proximal and bottom section of the knee. Um, I guess the big note there with the, the ACL kind of um, facts is that the the several avascular portions in the middle portion, which is the majority of the ruptures, is actually avascular. So um, hence why a lot of reconstructions are occurring. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, someone doesn't have the vascular supplies and can heal real well. Um, yeah. So diagnosing an ACL rupture, what do we do? Um, personally, I think everyone's pretty keen to, to jump into objective assessment, right? Like, you know, physios particularly, um, love putting hands on, love trying to pull joints and you know, think that we're pretty good with our biomechanical assessments. Mm -hmm. um, but with the ACL, uh, we know that within moments of rupture, the, um, particularly semimembranosis, but the, the hamstring um, will guard that resistant anterior translation of tibia. So uh, unless we're, you know, my clinical experience, I found within the first couple of minutes of an ACL rupture, it's quite easy to diagnose. Mm -hmm. And then outside of that, it gets a little bit more complicated. So. Um, some of my work running uh, field and port side, I've been unfortunate to experience ACLs in that very early stage and it's, mm. it's quite easy then. Um, but aside from that, I think if someone's presenting in a clinic, the most important tool that we have is their subjective assessment. Mm -hmm. So questioning, um, you know, exactly the mechanism for that injury, whether there's any previous history, um, mum or dad or even other me is, is a big indicator as well. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the key things that we see is, you know, on field I went to step and it, it's like my knee just gave away. Um, and you know, the common one is like a sniper and shot me from the stands quite close to the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the jump and land onto a leg um, and the, the knee kind of gives way under load is another. Um, it should stream up. Let's see if we can, uh, that's true. Hopefully I don't destroy too much tech here. <laughs> Don't touch no it. pressure. Don't touch it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. So this is a um. Does it come through onto that one? That's all right. It's not shared. That's all right. We can leave it. So this is a an ACL rupture from uh, um. 2015 season, I think it is. Um, you see the gentleman right at that point where there's a uh, massive valgus stress onto his right knee. So coming down the land. And right that's there. it. That's it. So as far as a textbook ACL rupture goes, that's... That's uh, all the force of pain. Yeah, body weight, um, big valgus stress. Um, obviously, the, the load can be from contact as well, but in this instance, it's just his body weight. You can see that... Is actually beginning to twist away to get some pivot, that yeah. Massive internal rotation or that mm. pivot shift type injury, mm. um, which for this uh, player only takes a, uh, a moment. Um, I hit the plate. Yeah, that was nearly too easy, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, common reports from our patients, so uh, it feels unstable. Uh, if there's meniscal involvement, we often have the clicking, the locking, the giving mm. way of the knee, um, depending on the location of the meniscal tearing, obviously. Knee might feel full or swollen. Um, I guess there's, there's apprehension around the knee as well. So if we've had just a strict ACL rupture without any meniscal involvement, they might not be clicking, locking, and giving way. But the patient might actually just report that you know just it feels really full and I just I don't feel comfortable with it like it's not it's not giving way on me but I just um, I'm not quite sure as to what's going on um, which is a little bit of a vague report but 
Um, if it's a strict ACL, realistically, we can do a lot of very uh, functional movements with it as long as it's you know, more of a straight line as opposed to direction change movements. Um, like we said, the henchman guards that ACL, so in clinic it becomes quite difficult to, to test for it. Um, having said that, there's three kind of, um, I don't know what you would typically use, Dr. Cole, but there's in you know, physio circles, a Lachman and anterior drawer and pivot shift test are mm -hmm. the, the more commonly kind of yeah. used tests. Um, so Lachman's very similar to an anterior drawer, one hand tibia pulling forwards um, and the other resisting that, that movement in the femur, uh, 20 to 30 degrees of, of flexion at the knee. Uh, anterior drawer is quite similar, except it's got a bit more of a knee bend. Um, and again, just trying to translate the tibia anteriorly. That's the, the most common um, test, I think, is an anterior drawer, but it's probably not as, uh, um, I don't know where the evidence base sits on it, but the, the hamstring guards very, very strong mm -hmm. in that position, which mm -hmm. can give us um, a false negative, obviously. Yeah, I push pretty hard on the hamstrings to try and disappear. Even, even though I'm small, but and I also, you know, lean back, use my body weight to pull back. Yeah. So I'm not using my arms to pull back, I'm using my arms to soften the hamstrings off. Yeah. And then the body weight makes it a really broad chest. Yeah. Because I'm really smaller. Yeah. And the lockman's I put my leg, my knee under their leg. Yeah. Because I can't lift it up. The legs too heavy for me to lift. So I just put the knee my my knee under their leg. Yeah. Can't do it in the kids yet though. I should say helps the hamstrings relax. Which one? Knee under the hands, under the knee. Your knee under their knee. Yeah. Oh, actually it helps them, helps them relax. You reckon? So yes. it softens them up a bit, yeah. you know, yeah, gets, I, them, gets them a bit loosened up. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they, they think that they support it. Yeah, true. Yeah. So that's how I modify it. Yeah, yeah. But the pivot shift, I find hard to coax them. You've got that pivot shift, have you? Yeah, yeah. so. I guess hard to teach them. Easiest yeah. to do that when they're the least charged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, that's cheating. <laughs> it goes every time when they're yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. I have had patients who worked out their own pivot shift tools, like you did it with this other leg. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a bit funky. I know. Yeah. You had a lot of time in this one. Yeah. <laughs> so those that might be un unaware of the pivot shift, um, we're kind of starting with 30 degrees that reduction and then taking 30 degrees hip flexion internally rotating the tibia um, and then putting a valgus force on the femur um, with the other hand and then taking into a flexion of the knee at about 450 degrees. Um, the IT band will cause the, the tibia to sublux anteriorly. Um, I don't really use it too much because if there is meniscal yeah. irritations, yeah. I should start with that. So yeah, that yeah. No. And if there's meniscal irritations, you, you're taking that knee into a pretty sensitive kind of position. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I sometimes just watch it like use it like a shoulder apprehension test. You just watch them for them to feel them tense. Mm. You know, you feel them tense up and you think, mm, here we go. Just, and, and also if they've got that extra, if it's not just an ACL, if they've actually torn a few, you know, parts of them, then they kind of they can't control it. Yeah. You know, it tells you the severity of the injury, you know, to the capsule structure. Yeah. Just gives you a hint. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You're gonna expose an NCL there as well, aren't you? Mm, those sort of things. If they yeah, if it really goes out. Um, I guess this is probably gold standard, and this is where uh, orthopods are fantastic at uh you know, access to imaging. But mm -hmm. um, so you can see the left image there, we've got a, a wavy ACL. Um, quite clear that it's not taut like the, the right image. Um if only all MRs came through that clear, that would be uh, yeah, that perfect. Like that. <laughs> yeah. um, so moving on from there, tearing locations, uh, a couple of different categorizations. So proximal avulsion is only about 16%. Um, and then proximal tearing without avulsion, 27. Mid-substance is 52%. And again, touch on the, the vascularity topic that we, we don't have great vascularity at any through the middle portion, and that's roughly 52%. Um, then our distal is only 1%, and distal avulsion is 3%. So keeping in mind that the majority of the tearing doesn't happen in the mid-body um, structurally, and looking at MRIs will really make it back to that. But, yeah, yeah. Let's actually talk about different age groups. Yeah. But the the tearing like, locations. Yeah. They yeah, do. 35, yeah. Yeah. Um, so obviously type 1 tears are more common in patients. Like yeah. 35. What are you yeah. looking for? 
Um, just that the common trend now to do primary repairs in the younger athletes. Yeah, yeah, he's just in type one and the in older, hasn't he? Yeah. And there's this new trend to do the primary repair, and if it's a partial tear at the lateral femoral condyle and everything, there's a seatbelt technique where you thread fiber tape through to through the injured ACL, secure it in the tibia, thread it through with the the torn portion and reattach the torn portion on. back on the femur. So you kind of created a you you put the torn portion back into the femur and you've got a seatbelt to protect it. Should mm -hmm. and that's common in well they're talking about it. Yeah, really common in young athletes. Yeah. So you don't take it down and then reattach the whole thing. You're actually leaving what's native and still attached. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that is an important. That's why I thought those stats. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. You, you would think it was the younger patient mm. in my experience because an avulsion fracture tends to be a younger person, but it, the mid substance. Um, is a vascular problem. See, that sounds like you'd expect that in an older person. Mm. Well, I don't think the vascularity changes throughout the, the decade. Oh, sorry, no. It'd be more of a risk in an older person. Yeah. So a vascularity, yeah. 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 You'd yeah. think that that would be an older. Um, but the, the seatbelt technique, the, the hope with that is that it's going to give the appropriate section. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 So... Yeah, yeah, I guess from, from, that. from a physio yeah. viewpoint, I, like anything less invasive is, is yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. tend to get better outcomes. And obviously, I'm not coming up to the study results or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very new. It's very yeah. Yeah. But I haven't just done research. Yeah. yeah, I've just done one. It, it doesn't, you know, the, you know the, the video, it doesn't quite suck up quite as tight as you want it to, but it gives them appropriate section. And in a younger person, you can give them appropriate section. Potentially, it gives them proprioception. Yeah. If you can give it, because that might be why we're getting reruptions, yeah. because they lost proprioception when they're really young, in their 20s, you know, they're going to pivot again. Yeah. You know, can you give, possibly give them that opportunity? Um, and then you're also protecting their donors, yeah. you know, their hamstring connectivity. Yeah. So, yeah, we can talk about that mm -hmm. yeah, again, because I've, I've written that down to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Which I guess is then only one rehab, right? Like if you harvest a hamstring. Yeah. That's a whole lot of <laughs> Physio good point. Yeah. Um, is it? Yeah. That's on my yeah. question list as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess tearing locations there. Yeah. Reruption risk. People are always interested in this. Um, this is all uh, from 2016. Uh, so a couple of years outdated now. There's a lot of conflicting data around percentages, you know, six right up to 35% of all ACLs rerupture. Um, most research is around the five ten percent mark, and mm -hmm. fairly consistent in the research that around the five to six percent for the contralateral, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. Whether it's just the sports that that person chooses to go back to, or whether it's just their controls not good enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the returns to high level sport increases mm -hmm. the rates of re-rupture. Younger patients are under twenty one are more likely to return to sport. It's probably a little less fear there. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also much more likely to re-rupture. Um, with most are mm -hmm. saying about a third, mm -hmm. yeah, which is probably, again, related to, to lack of apprehension or fear mm -hmm. following surgery. Mm -hmm. um, interesting data that came out um, was fairly kind of groundbreaking an idea you know, half a dozen years ago that waiting till nine months, we had 50% less likelihood of re-rupture mm -hmm. and then 30% less for every month after Twelve months. That's really interesting. Mm. When I listen to the go back in the eighties, we treated all primaries in a thirty degree splint, yeah, and did a full rehab mm. for three to six months or something, which was ludicrous. Mm. Looking back now, and the fact that they're not re rupturing if you wait, that would be a good suggestion to return to that type of treatment. But what going slower? Go slower, go conservative for mm. six to nine months. Why, why rush the first six months? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm, interesting. I think yeah. it's important for, for mm. us to be aware just for patients as well. Like uh, countless ACLs that are in their 80, 18, 19, like teenage years, early 20s, that are mad keen to get back to school. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, look, you're you know, doing really well when you return to, test, return to school testing, but 
the risk yeah. is still massive. Yeah, yeah. You know, is, it, is it worth that? You're yeah. getting paid 150, 200 plus grand a year to play sport, and if you're not, well, yeah, yeah. once a couple of months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so interestingly, for return to sport, you know, it's a good little plug for physios, the size 40% of the re-ruptures of the uh, return to sport it comes down to 5% with past return to sport testing. Oh, right. So failing return to sport testing and continuing to go and play mm. um, indicates about a 40% re-rupture of the bed So I guess we're doing something right there. I couldn't come across, um, and I haven't seen any evidence in the last couple of years for anything to do with Dome of sight and yeah. re rupture rates. Obviously. Every time I go to a conference, there's a presentation on mm. one or the other. Mm. So, one year it's patella, the next year it's hamstring. So, yeah. presumably, it doesn't matter. Yeah. The thought is, you know, that if you're using a bone patella bone, bone patella bone graft, you're going to get that really nice solid bone fixation. Yeah. But, I mean, is, is that then too strong a construct? You're better off with the softer sort of hamstring arrangement. You know, you know, how do you know? And we just argue. Uh, every yeah. year. <laughs> and the morbidity of this to be, you know, even though it's said to be gold standard biomechanically, the morbidity of this to be is huge. And yeah. all of us physiologically know that. Yeah. Patients can't kneel. Yeah. Yes. I can see. Yes, I did ask the question how do they have sex? Yeah. And I didn't get an answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> so you're welcome to ask that question to yeah. yeah, patients, but the, the orthopedic surgeons don't know the answer. No. <laughs> I think from the, the physio viewpoint, the interesting thing there is obviously the quad is so imperative in controlling the knee. Yeah. And we've gone and created a, a, yeah. a weakness in the mindset. And so rehab wise, it creates more work. And not that it doesn't happen with the hamstring. Yeah, for sure. The, the hamstring kind of can be built later in the process, later yeah. in the rehab. Yeah. Whereas if we if we you take can't the get the out the gate. Yeah, you can't, right. can't start out What about the quadriceps tendon grafts? Do you feel them the same? I'm gonna yeah, know. I've only had a handful yeah, of them yeah, yeah. from down south. Yeah, um, they're rare. Mm. Yeah, and I, I yeah, yeah rowing. it wasn't too much of a yeah. yeah. um, The uptake was quicker still in Victoria. Oh, okay. We launched the for the, tendon. For the quads. Well, yeah, the and that's got, a, that's got bone on it as well. It? it can have yeah. lots of bone in the mm -hmm. yeah. But now that they've got a good device that actually rings the tendon out mm -hmm. and it gets a consistently round cylindrical graft which is always consistently like seven millimeters even in young women mm -hmm. that's why that's taking mm -hmm. off big time taking off uh, a few surgeons in brisbane took off with it and a lot of the big afl mm -hmm. and ACL surgeons in melbourne have taken off with it and what do you think about rehabilitating it when it comes to rehab um the the thought that you can, they don't even research the quads back together, that you're only taking out a portion of the whole quads um, yeah. extensive mechanism. They're not they're not twitchy at getting going again? They they get going really well. And mm -hmm. there's less mobility with hamstring, especially in the elite athletes, like yeah. AFL players who take some of their hamstring. Yeah. Their ability to sprint and yeah. you know, a whole lot of different activities is great. They're slow. Yeah. yeah, if you've taken the hamstring, but with quads, it rehabilitates well. Oh. Yeah. yeah, sprinting with the hamstring is massive. Obviously, mm -hmm. comes up to about eight times that body weight you know, as we begin to hit full velocity. Yeah, you know, thirty minute sprint. So we've passed it. How many women can get someone back to sprint? And okay. That's obviously, yeah, that push up is what they miss. Yeah, that's what they notice. And obviously, the, the, the big stretch load when they're kicking. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hmm. Well, it's 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 quads, yeah. Does anyone up here doing quads tendons? Uh Sam, if you right. but I don't think he's I I'm pretty sure he doesn't have that device because that was the issue with it was getting out the osteotome and yeah. making your little triangle and then getting a strip and then discovering you've got four mils attached to your bone because yeah. the strip's tapered. So yeah. that, that that's the technical issue. And then you've got a long incision because you're not tunneling. So, so then you've got so to replace the size that just and then, got a small one inch incident. Yeah, over the vertical bit. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it was, yeah, it was a long incision and then and then you don't quite, you know, it was building the technique. Once we got the technique, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, so we're going to zip through uh, Tom Cross's protocol pretty quickly. Um, so one of the sports physicians out of Sydney 
Um, more recently, it's been doing a, a longitudinal study. Keep in mind, it's level four evidence. It's still on fairly early stages. Mm -hmm. um, his father, Dr. Merv Cross, was a, a renowned knee surgeon. Mm -hmm. I don't hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess they study the inclusions. So radiologists selected 113 patients. They finished with 80. So pretty selective to, to kind of trim a bit of fat off there. No meniscal injury was included. Um, no ACL rupture avulsion from the femur or distally outside of the uh, interpondylar notch. Um, and results were fantastic. So 90% of patients uh, showed ACL healing for three months. MRI, which is just so this is like a mid substance, mid substance piece is what they were looking for. Primarily, yeah. yeah, 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 that's what they were. Um, and the, mm. the non avulsion stuff, so the 16%, I think, yes. it was the, yeah, that come from the, yep. the proximal side. Um, yeah, so I guess, uh, in summary, the bracing you can see down the bottom there. So four weeks were locked 90 degrees flexed, uh, week five was slowly opening out, um, until we get kind of 10 weeks where a full range of motion in a ROM brace. And then 12 weeks that the brace gets removed. So mm -hmm. um, to be in a locked brace for four weeks is Good call. It's a massive call, mm -hmm. particularly for a lot of people who might not be able to uh, occupationally or socially or family wise. Can they go on a knee sitter, like can they kneel? Or is it? Yeah. I don't believe so. Not. <laughs> yeah. 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 The thinking is obviously that if we've got yeah. anterior yeah. pressure on the knee, yeah. it may help to the ACL to, to remodel because it's obviously it's mm. resisting the force of where the ACL would be. Mm. You know, so mm. it should help, but no, I don't, I don't think mm. so. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay. Yeah, so I'll run through a couple of quick slides there from um, mm. cross bracing pro protocol. So this came from a um, symposium that Latrobe did earlier this year in um, January. Um, we have done that in March, I think it was. So. Some of the, the summary points, as you can see, so the brace was locked at 90 degrees, uh, non-weight bearing on crutches for the first four weeks. That's the healing stage of the ACL. Um, so 24 seven, so you're sleeping in your brace. Um, yeah, pretty uncomfortable. Um, I guess the, the physio treatment, good education stuff, obviously beginning some basic exercises, soft tissue massage through the hands, quad trainers and the like. Um, functional exercises can kind of go on. Great opportunity to get um, one RM testing for the contralateral side um, in that first initial period before that uh, that better leg has wasted away. Um, week five and six, so uh, 60 to 90 degrees, we're still non weight bearing um, till the, the end of the sixth week. Um, the whole idea again is that the ACL is beginning to remodel here. So we're starting to load the ACL up through a little bit of range. So body load squat holds, um, as example, and, and various kind of hamstring and quad exercises. Nothing um, open chain and nothing too heavy. Coming into seven and eight weeks. Um, so we're still on crutches. We're weight bearing on crutches in week seven and, and week eight. Um, we're full weight bearing still on crutches though. Um, so that might come to a soft tissue again. Thinking is that the ACL is still remodeling at this stage. Um, physio is beginning to, to load a little bit more onto the leg with um, double leg press and hamstring curls. Um, obviously, a deadlift, those kind of exercises, getting back on the bike again as well. Mm -hmm. It should be happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. Seven weeks, yep, good. So, neuromuscular exercises as well, slides, points, you know, beginning the proprioceptive training. Um, contralateral limb is working pretty flat out at the normal kind of gym stuff where possible. Um, a big kind of thing that they had with the, this protocol is obviously you know, mobilizing someone for four weeks with mm -hmm. you know, no movement and then on weight bear for mm -hmm. six weeks and then gradual weight bear in the main crutches to you know, 10 weeks so um, or eight weeks rather. So anticoagulants was the whole way through there to try and stop DBTs, which is mm -hmm. obviously a very sound risk. Um, yeah, so it kind of progresses through all the stages and we won't kind of go too much into it, but I guess their results have been pretty amazing that, you know, 90% of participants, um, yeah, and I guess the, the final stages, 10 to 12 weeks, just polishing off the, the, the end stages of the rehab and beginning to make sure that they're, they're doing everything through dynamic balance and neuromuscular training exercises as well. Um, and then 
after that, I would be assuming that they would continue into more biometric mm -hmm. exercise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess from my point, you know, it's pretty clear they run through the obvious stages of, of rehab, so protective stage, some load introduction, um, and strength accumulation stage. They don't obviously talk about a training in their terms for stuff, which I think would be quite mm -hmm. interesting as to how exactly that's done. Mm -hmm. um, just looking at that, limitations for me, the, the quite obvious the average age was 26. Um, so young. quite young, mm -hmm. obviously not our average um, patient. 60% of which were male. Um, they were braced, had seen a specialist and had had an MRI within eight days. Mm. So that's mm. probably unachievable for most of us to even get to the GP within mm. eight days. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. 80% uh, of the participants were, were athletes, 50% of which were professional, mm. which I think is a massive, massive point for us to um, really, you know, if, if we injure ourselves as a professional athlete, that's our job. Mm. What can we do to get mm. better? If you tell me that I've got to do my way down and not be braced for 24 hours a day, probably just get on with it. Mm. Um, whereas the rest of us probably have to work with the clients and then. Mm. Uh, re rupture rates were, were higher, like 14% re rupturing. Um, obviously, we think back to our uh, participants or patients that past the attempts for testing was as, as low as kind of five or six percent. So mm. it's nearly triple that. Cost access to physio and specialists, I think, is a massive one. And then compliance for our average patients. You know, how, how likely are they going to be to actually stick the mm. whole way through mm. that? Mm. Yeah, massive and, and very, very kind of strict as to what's expected and what stages we're doing what. Mm. Um, obviously, professional athletes as well are very accustomed to exercise rehab. So they're going to, I think, struggle less with um, mm. being compliant. Mm. They know what the exercises are, it's mm. less energy. Yeah. Everyone has to put in to make sure that it's achieved. Mm. Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, on the compliance point, on crutches for 10 weeks, mm. you know, sleeping in a brace for, for 10 weeks, they're locked for four yeah. weeks. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is a couple other studies that are coming out. So another one in 22, which is another longitudinal study. Um, so 32 non-professional athletes. Um, 18 to 35 year age range, 53% um, healed within two years. Mm -hmm. And a chunk of that was shown on a, on a three month window. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Bit mm -hmm. of a, it's an interesting concept. Answer yeah. to the question does the ACL heal? Well, mm -hmm. potentially, but I think that um, it probably needs the right circumstances under the right patient mm -hmm. and the right caring location as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a bone and duck something bone. Yeah, I think. You're right, that's the trick. Okay, Tina, I might just say that. Question that we can use. Do you follow this brace on technique as a rehab protocol? No. Have I followed it? So we read it single room. Um, the limitations of what I would forecast as being, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that. Um, I think if you were in a sports um, club and everyone was turning up for training, everyone was turning up for rehab, this is what the physio said to do. You could just do it. I can yeah. understand how they'd be able to, in in Sydney how they'd be able to set up that system. But if you've got one poor person that's just trying to mentally cope with the bracing all on their own, I think that'd be tough, especially mm -hmm. if they then. Sort of became extracted out of their sports club yeah. because of an injury. Whereas I imagine in the big club, they just keep them coming. Mm. They, they've got to keep attending training, it doesn't matter. It's a bit like they have to go because otherwise yes. they're not showing up for work. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, I think it's a different cohort. Well, they do, regardless of when they're injured. Yeah. Yeah. Five pants, for example, if they're injured, they're still training. Yeah, yeah. They just turn up. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, Which brings in physio contact as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's very so, compliant. Yeah. And that's reasonable, but when it's human, yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting um, development out of MERV to kind of then move on to conservative treatment after 40 years. Of the yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. surgical treatment is pretty funny to see that. Is it a legacy? Yeah, yeah, I wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder what the, the grandson will do. Well, the grandchild yeah. will do. <laughs> you know, now we're seeing it for some of us.
Um, what's the first thing you explain to patients when they're coming after an ACL reconstruction, not ACL injury? What's the first thing you, what do you, what do you, what message do you want to get that patient in their first post-op visit? Um, what's the take home for the patient? Probably try and massage your brain in that first session. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought, that's not what I thought you were going to say. Yeah, but yeah, go yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. Um, with the idea that, you know, based off the research, we know that to do it well, it's 12 months. Yes. Yeah. Yep. You like you start with that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I agree. So yep. just getting them on board mentally that, hey, look, this is, you know, you're in a brace right now and you really sort of move mm. and that's going to get better. Mm. And when it gets better, it, you know, we're not it's just perfect. banging out of the gates and you know yes. I don't want to see you in six months yes. with a new ruptured ACL. Yeah. Um and I guess it's an important message to convey to patients to make sure that you know they understand that it is going to be a bit of a, a longer yeah. rehab. Yeah. And then from that I would jump straight back into bite-sized pieces. Yeah. So okay. Kind of letting yeah. them know, look, this is going to be a, a, a longer kind of effort on your yeah. behalf. Yeah, yeah. But look, let's just start with a little nibble. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So let's yeah, let's set some weekly and some fortnightly kind of goals. Yes. Yeah. And and yeah, and yeah. Track your progress that way. Yeah. I think we tend to see a lot of patients that have a lot of questions at that stage as well. Um yeah. of, like what do they ask? Whether it's pain related or yes. whether it's swelling related, yes. or maybe it's a bit of loss of sensation to a particular area of yeah, the skin. Yeah, yeah, correct. Right. And just reassurance to from us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, true. Um, and so just your re re return to sport testing, you were talking about. Yep. Um, my understanding is there's the, I, I, I have very limited understanding of what your return to sport test. I understand there is the jump test, which is that box jump, the box jump test. Yep. And I understand why that is useful. Do you, do you have a like a system for your return to sport testing? Yeah, so a couple of years ago, there was um, two fellows who released the Melbourne ACL. Um, yes, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I can't remember what they said though. Yeah, <laughs> so Mick Hughes and Randall Cooper were two yeah. guys. And, um, and I guess everything from there is detailed. It's it's nearly like a, a cheat sheet, if you want. Like, yeah, yeah. It's through yeah. What, we, what our goals are in the first four weeks and by yes. you know, three yeah. months. And, yeah. And it doesn't really quantify it in terms of time, but it's, it's good more kind of yeah. outcomes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and return to sport testing, I guess, is, is a whole. You know, gamut of different tests, whether it's endurance of muscle tissue for hamstring and quad, whether it's mm. bridges and sit stand, calf raises, mm. the strength mm. components where um, mm. their suggestion based on evidence is to push people to 1.8 times body weight for a single leg press, um, a squat. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I throw a deadlift in there as well, obviously, mm -hmm. for the hamstring for the hemigraph. Mm -hmm. um, then there's all the plyometric testing, which is jump distances and control and and, and that's your I presume when I, when I say return to sport we're talking about contact sports and not yeah. any other sports. Yeah so and I guess the the more facets of their sport that must come in. So yeah, yeah. if they're playing bowlers obviously it's yeah, yeah. different to well, the swimming return the to the bowlers, things. Yeah, yeah. And the contact is obviously in the end stage. So we would grade that, you know, mm. and grade it in terms of um, they've passed all of their non-contact return sport testing mm -hmm. and then we've moved into anticipated contact. Mm. So, you know, having external perturbations and so on, pushing them on. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Stuff, and then coming into unanticipated contact. You're trying to build their perception. But yeah. 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 And just, I guess, psychologically as well. Yeah. Um, true. They talk about I think it's three or four different psychological outcomes that they use and mm. scoring people um, at a certain threshold before mm. they're cleared to return to sport. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess we've got strength, endurance, proprioception, mm -hmm. biometric assessments, and mm. psychological assessments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's pretty thorough. And, mm. Detail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit hard when we're trying to work out a return to work and trying to visualise their workplace. Mm. And then they're uneven ground, and and then you know sometimes you're doing it on the back of not quite optimal rehab. You know they mm. they have sort of been distracted by you know other things. Yeah. 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 Um. I, I guess my next my next question here is um what indicators do you use to detect a re rupture of the graft? And I guess um you know what are the things that kind of make the hackles go up on the back of your neck where you start looking at it and you're thinking. I wonder for a re rupture. Um, when you're just looking at them clinically in your office, not when they're out playing. Yeah, yeah. It, it comes back to that subjective, I guess. Mm. Yeah. 
Mm. Um, and it probably sounds a little funny, um, but most people that have ruptured an ACL know when they've done it again. Oh, right, okay. Because yeah. the cu rotator cuffs don't tend to notice. Yeah, okay. Right? Yeah. It's sort of just it's more attrition, yeah. you know, yeah. whereas you think the ACLs, they feel it. Yeah, well, it's most That's definitely um, off. I've only had two, mm. uh, which are actually both contralateral legs that have re-ruptured and they, mm. they yeah, right. Yeah, so okay. they come in and they're going, all right, well, can you check my other leg? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, and then I guess it comes back to that subject of questions of what we were doing. Yeah. Um, where was your knee oh, position? But, and how you know, you what, to... what about the ones that re-ruptured the original graph? Yeah. Um, again, I'd, I'd subjectively kind of ask yeah. them to try and Do you think they feel it? Um, not too sure. Yeah, bit of a mix. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's kind of, yeah. One that I had, he knew. Um, yeah. And right. In his instance, he was, he was halfway through his rehab, seventeen year old boy, yep. and was shooting, shooting a basketball around with a couple of mates, and he just yeah, took a little yeah. jump shot. Yeah. And came down and knee straight. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Then I guess it would go back to that turns on objective testing. Yeah. yeah of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just thinking. You know, there's that moment where you're looking at them and you think, no, nah, I think we've done it. You know? mm. And what, what does that sort of feel like? And, and you know, what are you, what are you looking for? What indicators are you sort of... But it's only 5%, so it's pretty low. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I do, you know, have seen, um, you know, they eventually they come to see you, see us, you know, after they re-ruptured. And sometimes it can be very difficult to tell when the re-rupture was and they don't always remember. So yeah. I'm often yeah. trying to date... When the re-rupture was, because sometimes they think it was last week, and in fact, there's evidence to show that maybe it wasn't. Yeah, okay. mm. so yeah, yeah. So sometimes we can't tell. Yeah. Um, we've already talked about this. What's your favourite donor, the hamstring or the patella? I think we've uh, we've decided hamstring. Yeah. But we're yeah. maybe interested in the quadriceps. We've got a decent that's instrument that's for harvesting it. Probably where there's a future. Yeah. Mm. And who's got the harvester? Okay. Right. Awesome. Excellent. Good answer. Um. Uh, oh, here's an, here's an easy one. If they've ruptured their ACL, how long after an ACL rupture uh, injury would you recommend that they see a physio and when do you refer to a specialist? Uh, straight away. <laughs> I straight thought away. it was an easy one. <laughs> and why do you want to see them straight away? Why would a GP refer them to a physio straight away after an ACL? Um. Education is the first point, Good. obviously. Yeah. Um, try and work out if it is. Uh, like, so obviously they may have seen a GP for an MRI. And mm -hmm. they yes. Come and Correct. An ACL rupture. Yes. Um, education as to kind of how they want to manage that. Yeah. Um, whether it's yes. there's meniscal involvement, whether yes. you know, the knees clicking and locking and giving way. Yeah. Understanding that if if it is and the, the meniscus is actually folding back on mm -hmm. itself and, yeah. and pinning, well then might have a memory to stay there. So that's probably for us, you know, don't contact Dr. Cole and wait, like all email yeah. and now. Yeah, yeah. Try and get the stuff yeah, a bit so. more urgently. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 um, yeah that's good. So, yeah. yeah, as soon as possible mm. to answer mm. shortly. Yeah, um, yeah. And whether it's everything from a strength program, if, if it is just a strict ACL and there's a wait period before they can see a specialist, mm. well, let's not tread water for three months and waste away. Mm. Let's, let's keep you nice and strong. We mm. don't want any run, jump, land, pivot shift activities. But we'll you can give it strength. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. agree. We'll still be yeah. pushing big weights in the gym. Do you, um, do you try for proprioception even without a real con? Yeah. If yeah. you build yeah. it in this part of the program. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's all graded, obviously. So, yeah. you know, it might even be something so simple as just being a single leg stance. Balance. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, where's my next one? Um, uh, jump test, yeah. Uh, so, so one of the talks I went to was about returning to sport at nine months, and they, you know, they were sort of umming and ahhing about whether or not it was worth doing. But the message I'm hearing from you is okay, you're not going to go back to sport until 12 months, let's build a really solid rehab program. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. There's no rush to kind of do your jump test today, yeah. Let's Build your strength first. Yeah. Is that what you is that Definitely. what you hit them with? Yeah. yeah at the yeah. beginning. Yeah. Um I've returned two of my ACLs, um, which you know, must have been seven or eight years ago. Mm. Uh, nine months. Mm -hmm. uh, and? Fortunately, they're all the rough shit. Yeah, your heart's in the mouth. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right in the mouth. Pre the evidence base coming yeah, out. Of course. So, yeah. Um 
But where is it now? now? You no. just say don't worry about it. Yep. Yeah. Not worth it. Um, I had an interesting case with um, some elite level uh, footy player a while ago who partially ruptured an ACL. Yes. Um, and it was, yes. well, what do we do here? Do yeah. We wait 12 months for partial rupture of an yeah. ACL. Um, and the verdict of the call from the specialist was put them through the return sport testing. Yeah, and yep, and see what they've got. If they can pass the all, well, then so they're they're good. Good. Yeah. yeah, give them six weeks and, yeah. and let it have a bit of R&R. &R. Yeah. Um, so in his particular instance, yeah. he'd return to play in like eight or nine weeks. Yeah. Yeah, plus the option. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. It has been an option since. Yeah, yeah. That is, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you think it would be picked up by, by now, yeah, because you know, 18 months, yeah. Um, the what is it? Uh, the um, so the thing that we see when we get in there is that when it avulses, it tends to flop downwards. Um, so it, it it's not that it's pulled off and that's avascular, it's just more that. It's not physically, it's physically a long way away from where it needs to get to. Now, it sticks down to the PCL, which is why you can have a ruptured ACL. You know, I think it's pretty asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. So they would just get going. Mm -hmm. But until it sticks down, you don't know what you're feeling. Um, and then the other thing we were talking about, you talked about predispositions. We were taught about the notch size in the women, the notch, the intercondylar notches just that bit smaller and presumably when they pivot it can sort of catch mm. as they pivot but that's the only anatomical predisposition yeah and they talk about sort of doing a notch plasty which is where you, you intentionally make the bone your notch just a little bit bigger yeah. in the hope of preventing yeah. re-rupture after a recon but i haven't gotten very much because i'm not convinced about how much you need to take and how much is sort of effective, but that's one of the only common kind of predispositions that explains that in a little bit. But it netball is just yeah. basketball gone wrong. No, don't quote me on that. No, don't, it's the rule. <laughs> it's the rule so hard on their knees. Yeah, that's what I mean. It, it's just really tough on their uh on their knees. Yeah. yeah. And their ankles. So yeah. And netball Australian realizes that they, they yeah. sort that follow the I don't use style, but uh, yeah. you know, kind of modified FIFA 11 for the yeah. netball knee program. Yes, yes. Which essentially was the same movements and the same warm up based off yeah. know, football or soccer's uh, yes. you know, kind of well, evidence base. Yeah, to yeah. To try and prevent ACLs, but yeah, it's a. Yeah. Well, anything you can do to prevent it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys got questions or are you you're all ACL there, ACL up to date? What's your take on uh, like the I don't know. I can't decide if it's going to be a flash in the pan and it's going to disappear again. But there's certainly there is ACL reconstructions where you get to the end of it and you think, I've done a great operation. Oh, it doesn't feel as stable as I was expecting it to feel. Yeah. And I think that's the cohort that needed. Yeah. Is that and they just need a little bit tighter, just a little bit. And sometimes I think they get it because they freeze up or they get really rigid and get really tight. You know, you don't always want them to loosen up straight away. But I think I like it, but I just try very hard to uh, try very hard to minimize my use. I wouldn't use it as a standard. Like I know there's a lot of people that just always do it because they never want to see a re-rupture. If you've got a five percent re-rupture rate, then it suggests that probably what everyone's the standard operation is probably is okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's got its place. And the, the trouble is you get to the end of the operation and you know you've got to test everything. So the first thing to test is whether or not the ACL is hitting against the inside of the notch. So you take it out in full extension and just get a really good feel. Like you watch it coming out in full extension. You can't quite see. And you make sure it's not impinging to full, in full extension because then they'll just sit in flexion and the physio goes insane mm -hmm. because they keep sitting in flexion. Um, and so, and, and then, you know, you want to do your anterior draw and, you know, you do your Lockman's first and you're like, mm -hmm. I think I'm you know, pretty hot. I'm a pretty awesome surgeon. <laughs> then you do your ACL and you can't, you know, you kind of feel that. And I think if it's that, it's that grade a half, AC, yeah. you know, anterior draw, uh, where you start thinking, oh, hold on, let's just slow it down here and, you know, yeah. just make you think about stabilizing it further. Um, and then, you know, when you're really awesome, you do your pivot shift and you, you know, go and speak to the pivot surgery on the <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, that's good fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah.
but there's lots of technological changes that you know I've been around for 20 years and sort of see it all come and go. And the, the screws were great, but you can't see anything on the MRI scan afterwards, which is like the same with shoulders. We just, you know, you had they retorn their rotator cuff, you had no idea. So the screws are hard work. The endo button, it's got a little flip on it. And when you put it, you put it all the way in, and it's it's a it, it goes in like a like a it's like a tube, but then you've got to flip it to get it to sit on the bone. That's kind of a feel thing, you know. So it takes a bit of practice to get it to suck down onto the bone. That, that always makes me a bit nervous, but it's got a little bit of spring in it. So instead of like when you screw it in, it's rigid. And so the thought is with just a little bit of gear, you might knock off that, that re rupture rate. Yeah. Um, and then the question I like to leave my tibial hamstring graft attached distally, um, which is a bit controversial because you've got to then adjust your length to make sure you get it to the femur um but i just wonder if it's got a bit more vascularity is that going to help it mm. Mm. i don't know it's it's just a it's just a hope that you're sort of improving the vascularity and reduce i mean you've got only a five you've got such a low complication rate that you just want to keep we're always trying to dial that down a bit you know yeah. you're always striving to make it better mm. but uh, what we were saying before about the seatbelt repair is that the first half of the operation is just removing the ACL and you can spend 20 minutes of grinding away at their existing ACL, which of course, you know, that couldn't be a good thing. You're having no. to remove something that's big and chunky. Sometimes there's no ACL there. Yeah. You know, you're just looking at the stump, looking at the uh, cubicle and you're just thinking, well, you know, you've got to start from scratch. And But sometimes you get in there and there's this great big ACL just sitting there looking at you, you know, detention, wavy lines. Mm. And you think that just wants to go, that just wants to go another three millimeters and it'll get there and you can dock it, you know. So yeah. so that I think that's gonna be exciting. The quadriceps tendon, and the, the the repairs. I don't know how you're gonna rehab the repairs that would be. Yeah, well, not too sure. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully yeah. you can do it the same. It just depends on it depends on yeah. how well it's docked and it's hard to know. Mm. Yeah. You, you would like to think that it would shorten sure up. Yeah, yeah. Time frame. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Especially taken a, you've taken a, a donor away. Yes. Doesn't exist anymore. Yes. Um, Certainly not from that Yeah. Yeah. But if half the ACL is still attached, yeah. then you Pretty could good. argue that you could do an accelerated, but again, if, if they're doing the primary repairs in the younger athletes and the adolescents, mm. because the age of ACL injuries is coming right down. Yes. I mean, the fact younger. that we've got nine and 10 year olds doing ACL injuries is saying a lot about sport. Mm. But if the age of the individual that's suffering the ACL is getting younger mm. and we're doing primary repairs, then you could argue that you want to actually slow them down anyway because the young people that you can get away with the young and active now is that a good thing for something that's vulnerable mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, and i mean i guess if, you know if you look at it from the perspective of what if they get the re-rupture you know which where's your next going i coming from so if you've done a repair first then at least if they re-rupture if they're very disappointing then you've got your hamstring or your tongue tendon you're not mm -hmm. sort of scratching around looking for donors so it's nice to think it's going to keep evolving. Yeah. I did sports physio in 1985. And then we do, you know, when I've trained as a physio, they were doing black mats with the what? Band. I don't even know what that is. Macintosh with oh, the Macintosh. What, why is it called the black mat? Because you didn't like them? They so were yeah. adding Teflon and all sorts of Oh, right. Okay. Right. To it. So, so you, try know, you, do you know what this procedure was? No, no, it's, so, it's so for me. the ACL, they, they take the ITB and they kind of wrap it around yeah. the knee three times and tie a knot. You know, like it was, they, the ACL was completely, well, it wasn't considered to be relevant, really. It was just a stability, stabilizing procedure and they put them all in fast. Yeah. Well. And by 1985, it was the slope and repair and everything else. So the evolution. Yeah, yeah. What? Been a few. And whether it's metallotendon tendon or it's hamstring or it's this or it's that, it's going to keep evolving. Yeah, definitely. But it didn't develop. Did he develop a particular technique? He didn't do hamstring, was he? I think he was one of the gurus that was doing a lot of oh, them. Yeah. Before Pachevsky. Right. Yeah. Um, 
The allograph is another one. Sorry. The allograph. Yeah. 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 Well, that was that sphere that yeah. had the allograph and landed, and yeah. she was out. Yeah. I mean, and the allograph. I mean, they're still we're still using allograph if you've got to do a multi ligament is reconstruction that you've got no choice you've got to take yeah, it. Yeah. But we've never I mean it, it's hard to demonstrate good vascularity in yeah. the graft. You, yeah. you just no. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then it's a matter of time and it's a matter of sort of using it. You want to use it in some way that doesn't get a lot of movement. Yeah. Yeah. So but it's yeah, it's been an in, it's an interesting evolution. A little bit of a Mm -hmm. You want me to wind it up? Is that what that looks like? Yeah. Is there any questions online as well? Oh, no, no, we're good, actually. Thank you. Good question. Well, thank you very much. I'll, um, Thanks, Dr. Cole. That's right. I'll turn the recording nice. so we can ask more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much. Uh, oh, you paused. No, no. Yeah, thank you very much for coming along tonight. And, um, uh, and giving us some advice about ACL, but um, I agree, you know, we need to have a bit of a broader conversation to sort of talk about the basics of anatomy and understand the pathology and then also it's good to hear all the sort of innovations and, and the contribution that we've got. So thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having us. Very welcome. <laughs>